Continuing with the topic of the kingdom of God and heaven and this whole notion that um, prayer might be a system or some sort of underlying reality to the universe and as uh, we've been uh, going into the role of the father, this father that Jesus often would speak about as the genesis of anything that we want on earth and when I say anything I mean anything because this is the word that is used in the scriptures uh, a lot of the people who who hear these things for the first time they say oh no it's the will of God and the will of Jesus that they are gonna give you something that you deserve or so no and there's no evidence in the scriptures where it says anything like that related to Jesus at least. Maybe perhaps in the in the further scriptures related to the church or the people who were studying the church, we have to understand that there are two sets of evidence when we when it comes to the scriptures. One is the set of evidence that is relate related strictly to Jesus, and the other one is from the people who began the churches years after Jesus died, years after um, the Jewish Roman world ended uh, 60 years at least after Jesus died. That's when the documents started circulating and people started uh, going with the ideas of the cult, not the ideas of Jesus. It was what they understood from the events, not the ideas of Jesus. So what I do in this work is go straight into any passage and any teaching that is strictly related to this figure who we supposed might have been quote unquote enlightened. So this figure of Jesus, he made some very strange claims. Uh, a lot of people think these are allegories, they are hyperboles, they are sarcastic sayings, they are exaggerations. So, but when we look into them with a new, newer perspective, with a different perspective, we can see perhaps what lies behind them. So we're gonna go with the one that uh, I, I've stated before. He he said something about the mountain. If you think, if you say to the mountain, it's gonna throw into the sea, and you really believe in it, it's gonna happen. If you truly believe in it, this is what he said. But we can find another passage where he makes a reference to this, well, to this mountain. It makes reference to this mountain. We can find it in the Gospel of Thomas. This is the one that was found in the Nag Hammadi library in, in the 1940s or 1940s. It was one of the newer evidence, uh, the newest evidence that we have uh, from the scriptures and it, it, it goes into this passage but it, it has a bit of a different take on it. So it goes like this. Jesus said, if two make peace with each other in a single house, they will say to the mountain, move from here, and it will move. Gospel of Thomas 48. Now, the mountain is there. We can see it. If we think about it, that it's going to throw itself into the sea, will it throw itself into the sea? Probably not. This uh, this is not the rule set of the physical universe that we understand. This, this is not going to happen. So what is he speaking about? Is, he being, uh, is this an exaggeration? Did he actually do anything like that? Not precisely. This is one of the instances where the, the, the message of Jesus gets a bit complicated. Um, but we have to remember that allegedly this uh, person, he healed the sick, he, he brought people back to life, um, he withered a fig tree with his thoughts, and allegedly, just like everything else, he overcame his own death. So this is, these are the things that we are uh, scaling, we are balancing on the scale. So we have these strong uh, allegations and then we have this exaggeration that never happened. It's not part of the possibilities of the rule set of the physical world as we understand it. But I'm just going to throw something in here that it, this will be analyzed later and especially in the second part because the theme of mountains exists in different uh, ascetic principles in different ascetic sayings. Could you throw a mountain into the sea in your dreams? Most likely, in your dreams you can do it. And I'm just gonna throw that uh, out there uh, because that's gonna be part of a different, different um, 
understanding. But for now, I'm gonna focus on one of the parts of this uh, saying. It says, if two make peace with each other in a single house, what does that even mean? And we can actually find a reference to this passage in, in one of the canonical Gospels. <clears throat> and uh, the, the passage that I'm gonna read is mainly uh, understood and thought of uh, as the importance of the church or something like that, but if we look at it closer, it seems to give us an introduction to the holographic principle. No, not strictly as the scientific proposal, but as the, the main concept of a hologram, which is that what we see in the image of the hologram is actually encoded somewhere else and this is directly in one of the canonical Gospels open to the public. So it goes like this. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church, and if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Matthew 18, 15, 20. Now, as I said before, it seems that the modern interpretation of this passage is mainly to do with the importance of the quote-unquote church, but when Jesus refers here to church, he is referring to the early cult, to the early society that was emerging from the... all the way back to John the Baptist, the, the early... You could call it a hidden society, or perhaps it could even be society society at large, because church back then was just to, it was a congregation, it was a people coming together. So if we if we go into the core of the story, he's basically telling uh, people that when when one uh, incurs into sin which I've explained in the fourth chapter, as I said, because I started with the fourth chapter, but if you, if you haven't gotten there, in the fourth chapter, I speak about the, these scenes as being some sort of a mistake from the mind, an error, uh, missing the mark is the correct interpretation of this. So if you see something, someone with a, a, a wrongful um, pattern of thinking, go and point out their fault. And it stays between the two of you. It's not very important. You can let it go. And this quote-unquote let it go is the actual definition of forgiveness as understood in the Bible. I will speak about that uh, more towards uh, after the, the half of this, of, of this work. I go into this whole concept of repentance, of forgiveness of sins, which basically is translated as letting go. But in this exact passage, he tells us a bit about this. So he's saying, go to more people. Tell one or two more about this, so that this person that has a, a wrongful pattern of thinking ca can understand what's going on. And he's saying, if they still refuse to listen, then go to the church. Go to a larger congregation of people. And see that, make, make sure that they see their mistake, that it becomes more real, because if it's just a secret between you and them, then it's whatever, nobody really knows about it, but when you take it to the quote-unquote church, to, to a congregation, to society at large, then everybody's speaking about it, and it becomes very real. And he goes and says, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Jesus was a human, he had human emotions, he didn't like pagans nor tax collectors, mainly probably because pagans were in a mistake, they didn't understand this larger reality that Jesus was 
uh, understanding, just as he didn't like the traditional Jewish uh, beliefs, as he was constantly defying them. So he goes on to say, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What is he telling us here? He is comparing this act of bringing people together to quote-unquote bind something to make it real, to, to, to make it happen. And he's saying that what, what is bound on earth will be bound in heaven, just as whatever is loose, whatever you let go, Whatever you, you don't really, you know, if the secret stays between you and the person who quote-unquote sinned, it's not very important. It's loose on earth and in heaven. So the, the, the very words that Jesus chose to use here, I mean, the, the people who wrote the scriptures in Greek used very specific words that come from the whole cult, that come from the the actual teachings of Jesus. So the connotation of the words is very important. And this is one of the instances that the very connotation of the words go all the way to the English language. He's talking about earth. He's talking about the globe. He's talking about what we can see as physical reality. And when he, he's talking about the heaven, the word in Greek is Uranus which is the, the, where, where the planet Uranus comes from and is the, the main personification of what, one of the primordial beings or entities that came in the histories of creation, in the, in the stories of uh, creation from the Greek mythology. It's one of the first emanations from when there was nothing. There was chaos and then there was Uranus. So this word heaven can also be understood as the higher heights, as the sky, as the atmosphere indeed. It's, uh, this is why people thought it was like a realm in the clouds, it's something else, but it, the connotation suggests that we're speaking about higher cosmology, about primordial realities, primordial entities, and as Jesus suggests here, it is a different realm where you are literally acting at the same time. You're acting upon both heaven and earth at the same time, for why, would, why, why could you bind something on earth and bind it in heaven at the same time? This is exactly what he is speaking about this, let's not lose the idea here, he is telling us whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed on heaven. He is explaining how these two frames of reality act upon each other. This is what I meant by the holographic principle. So if something on earth is bound by bringing a lot of people together, and everybody sees it, and all their consciousness act upon it, they create something, they are binding it on earth, just as it is being bound in heaven. So it most likely is vice versa, is the other way around. Whatever is uh, loosed on heaven, whatever is forgiven in heaven, perhaps that quote-unquote kingdom which is within and all around will be loosed. The word, the word uh, for loose in Greek is the Greek transliteration liset. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but if we go to the definition of this word, it means to let go, to unbind, to release. This is strikingly similar to the idea of forgiveness of sins, which I spoke about in the fourth chapter. Or if you're going there, you will find it there. It's about letting go, undoing things. It's not about guilt, as the dogmatic narrative have us believe. It's about let it go, perhaps loosening this. Wherever the information, wherever the data is encoded, so we can see it on earth. Here we can see how when we look directly at the scriptures, and we have a different perspective, we can see 
things that ha we haven't seen before, but they are right there. He is speaking about this realm that we are acting upon at the same time as we are walking on Earth. And as I said, this kingdom within, what is he speaking about? So we have in the, in the scriptures that this quote-unquote kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the Father, they're, they're, they seem to be the same thing. And he said, it's not there, it's not, it's not up in the air with the birds because they will precede you. It's not in, with, in, with the fish in the sea because they will precede you. It's not here or there, it's, it's, it's nowhere. It's within and it's all around. It's everywhere, it's omnipotent, it's omnipresent. This is the nature of the Father. The Father is in me and in you and I in you and you in me. This whole thing that Jesus said that was very confusing, this whole pantheism of being in different frames of reality at the same time. So to recap a little bit, we have the idea, the notion that he says, when you are about to pray, go to the kingdom first, go within, and then from there you ask for anything, you visualize it, you go through the cognitive process of thinking about what is it that you want, and he says anything. I repeat, as I said, at the beginning of the video, it doesn't say the will of God, what he will give you. It doesn't say my will be done upon. No, he said, pray for anything you want. And if you truly believe, have faith, quote unquote, faith, that it's going to happen, it will be added onto you. You will see it. It will be bound on earth because you have created it on this other frame of reality, which is called heaven. There's this primordial entity of creation that came out of the chaos, this Uranus, then it is gonna appear here on earth. And he said, you ask with shameless audacity, you tell the tree whatever you want it to do, and if you truly believe it, it's gonna happen. He is speaking about this mental discipline, about this cognitive, cognitive process, about binding something on earth. This is the principle of mentalism. And it's right there, open in the scriptures. To add more reference to this notion, if we go off a little bit into the dogmatic Christian narrative, and we think about the main idea of heaven, is this place that you have to earn, that you go to uh, somehow by complying to very vain, selfish needs of what seems to be a very narcissistic uh, profile of a god. It's, it, it, Jesus does not speak about this anywhere. He does not say, I'm God and you will, my will be done. He's a way, as I've gone through this video series and as I went through this book, uh, any of the passages that I reviewed, it, it nowhere says that. It says something very different. And when we start understanding what he was trying to tell us, we can change the whole paradigm of what Christianity is based upon. So, again, he, it's not about that. You're acting upon the, the realms at the same time. We will see this in the future as he speaks about the spirit. This is a main theme. I speak about themes and patterns that are repeated in many philosophies. This is one of these, of these themes. Uh, when he speaks about the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, this is why this, the book of the name is uh, the Ghost of Jesus, he, it is very similar to this whole notion, this pantheism, this energy that is everywhere and lives within us, and we are acting upon different frames of reality at the same time. And of course, this is something that scientific evidence is uh, putting forward, right? But in any case, if we keep going with the maxim of his ministry, he's saying, when two gather, anything they ask for will be done for them by the Father in heaven. It is the same message when he is telling us how to pray. He's saying anything you ask for. But he is adding, if two on earth agree, agree into this process of binding, agree into this creation, this manifestation, and the word that he's, he, 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 he the, the words used to follow this are very important as well, as part of that connotation that I, I've been speaking all, all along, he says, it will be done for them.
It's a process. It's not a judgment. It's a process. It's binding on earth. So the Father in quote unquote heaven, this other frame of reference, this friend of yours that you are to ask with shameless audacity, quote unquote, as we saw in the previous video, it will give it to them. It shall be added onto them. It will be done like a process, like a system. And the word in Greek for this is, uh, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, is genesetai, which is uh, genesis. It, it, it will be produced. It shall be done. It will come to pass. These are the words that represent this idea. It's not, I will give it to you because of I want to. No, it says it will come to pass. It will become. It will happen. It will emerge. We are speaking about cause and effect, action and reaction, not judgment. To finish up the chapter, as it has gone longer than I wanted to, but this is perhaps one of the most important notions that we have to, to get, to understand. Uh, we speak about consciousness. We are speaking about binding things on that. So he's telling people, he's telling us, if more people come together towards something and put their attention into something, it's going to come to happen. It's going to be bound. The more people there is, the more bound it is, the more real it becomes. And I want to make emphasis on this because the, the latest scientific findings from 1900, from quantum theory, which haven't been a uh, subject, tell us this, that consciousness, our individual consciousness, affects reality, matter, at the quantum level, at least as we understand it so far, more experiments are being done. But this is what is telling us. Nothing is solid. We affect this reality with our consciousness. So as we will see further with the miracles, there's one curious thing that repeats all over the, the quote-unquote miracles. And that is that Jesus always tell tells people, make sure that you tell no one about this. He keeps it secret. Perhaps there's a bigger reason for this. And as the last thing that I want to say in this video, uh, in, the, in the passage, it ends with, For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. In my name. This is perhaps one of the largest, this is perhaps the biggest misinterpretation of the message of Jesus. When he says, in my name, Onoma, he is speaking about the character, an essence, his name, but as him. And he says, there am I with them. This am I, this is the first I am that we, we will encounter. This is why we, the church, deified Jesus, the Jesus persona, instead of the very essence of being, the I am. This is known as the principle of society. This is the name of God as thought, about, for, for, uh, as thought by the Jewish people. I am what I will cause to be. I am that I am. I am the primordial essence of being. And this will be the subject of the next chapter. If you're on the path of finding the truth about reality and our purpose as humans on Earth, the information that I have to share concerns you. After a lifetime of research in philosophies ranging from Buddhism to the occult, I've encountered themes and patterns along some baffling information that is beginning to be seriously studied by science. A rational divine outline, the ghost of Jesus, is the first iteration of this project, where I analyze the message of Jesus without dogmatism, fanaticism, or religious bias. You can find my work available on Amazon on the link below. If you find this work valuable, consider subscribing, sharing, and following me on social media, as it'll help others in the same path to find this information. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.